All right. So we've looked at this Lieber Oz thing and talked about man being free. So what Crowley's really getting at is every man has the indefeasible right to be what he is, the right to self-preservation and self-fulfillment. And magic should be deployed in all actions, including thought actions, including your thoughts. That's why they say, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, but love under law, love under will. The will is important, but the law is about love. Love is equally a part of it. Magic is the fulfillment of the individual into prosperity in all forms. You, it's something you have to do. You have to figure out who and what you are. And at that point, as you're doing that, you unite with this thing called the Holy Guardian Angel. And the Holy Guardian Angel is the tool, is the guide to find your true identity, to realize the limitless power within a person and the limitlessness that one can deploy that force. And the angel is there. The angel guides you. So talking about the holy guardian angel, we come to a guy who we read today named J. Daniel Gunther. He is an American born in the 1950s into a family of Baptists. His father was a Baptist minister. Again, another fundamentalist Christian. And he was very devout. The whole family was devout. And he started studying Greek and Latin in his youth. Over a long career as a practicing occultist in the AA, which I'll explain more about in a second, he became known as an authority in hermetic philosophy related to the cer to ceremonial magic and Aleister Crowley. He's well sought out. He's well sought as a speaker around the world. I haven't met him. All my friends who have said he's pretty amazing. He became over time not only an expert in Latin and Greek, but conversant in Egyptology. Like many long-term practitioners, he is able to be an expert without being, say, an academic. He doesn't have a PhD like this goofball right here. His work dances across religions and languages. And in such, he's always building toward these greater arguments about connecting to the Holy Guardian Angel, realizing the will, and finding a path to self-realization through initiation. I will admit, though, that when he talks about Indian stuff and Sanskrit materials, he gets a lot of it wrong. That's okay. He's not a Sanskrit scholar. He wrote some amazing books, one of which we read part of today. The one I really like is called Initiation in the Age of the Child. And then we read today The Angel and the Abyss. In some groups, his books are considered near scripture. So what is the AA and what is the OTO? We have the sigil or the steel of each here. Now, Crowley established two bodies, the OTO, which Richard Kaczynski says is like Freemasonry on steroids, and the AA which Kaczynski says is like Golden Dawn on steroids, which I think is kind of cool. Um, the OTO is a fraternal co-gendered order, so everybody's allowed. And the AA is a little different. It's initiates only. It takes all genders, takes all people, but it's decentralized. So theoretically in the AA, the order of the star, funny, what does the AA stand for? Some people will say, oh, it's Argentum Astrum, the order of the silver star. Other people will say, oh, no, it's Angel and the Abyss. Other people will say, no, it's an A and an A. And anybody else who says anything else is buffoonery, which I find really amusing. Anyway, so in the AA, as opposed to the OTO, it's very secretive. In the AA, theoretically, you only know your teacher and your students. And as you progress, you're given students. The practices and doctrines are sent down by your teachers, and you send them down to your students. Now, in fact, there are several lineages of the AA. Gunther is the head of one lineage, and they hate each other. Man, these people argue on the internet as if they want to kill each other. And sometimes they do seem like they want to. I know one practitioner who's a pal of mine said, I asked, hey, you ever get interested in the AA? He says, I'm not political enough for the AA. I mentioned the same statement to another pal of ours. He says, that guy, does he seem like he's ever even read a book? They're just, it's like the, it's like the story about you know, uh, it's a story about two ra about a rabbi in a, on an island, and he builds two temples, one to worship in, or two synagogues, one to worship in, and one to never step his foot into. Religion divides people. It often does. Okay, so within both of these systems, there are 10 grades of initiation. This is based on this tree of life. The tree of life comes from the Jewish Kabbalah. Does it actually perfectly reflect it? Absolutely not. 
It doesn't at all. It's it's its own thing outside of Jewish mysticism, but it piggybacks off of it. So the initiations are based on 10 stages from the neophyte at the 110 to the epistemist to the 101. It's really confusing to read about because they have like seven, four, six, five. Either way, it always equals 11. This is the lower stage, which is as far as most people ever get in the OTO or the AA. And you have the middle stage and the upper stage. In the OTO, this is said to be um, the man of earth. These are the lovers. These are the hermits. So it's like you get so far along that you have to withdraw from the order itself into these deeper mysteries. Now, the tree of life says up here, this one through three is pure divine radiance. Down here, these little bottom ones, these four down here, those are the material world. In between is the world between. Go figure. Here is the abyss, the veil of the abyss. And this is what stages being the babe of the abyss. That means when you become a babe of the abyss, it ain't good. Um, everything you've learned gets dissolved. And you pass through a phase where even the holy guardian angel is gone. There is no God. There is nothing. Everything you've done is erased. And you go through that spot, you go through that transition, and then boom, it's reborn afresh, anew, and alive. So that's why they're talking about, that's what people mean when they talk about talk about passing the abyss. So um, one of the things that's kind of kooky about this is that I hear a lot of people when they first read about this or hear about this say, oh, I'm going through the abyss. It's exhausting. The abyss is not an existential crisis or a bad period in your life. It's pushing through religion and symbolism to thoroughly lose all your understanding of the world and be transformed, reunited with all that you've lost. And who do you meet on the other side? But that holy guardian angel. I would argue, and Gunther agrees, <laughs> that anybody who says they've crossed the abyss has not. Gunther says there's a speech in silence, and crossing the abyss takes you into silence. This whole system is aspirational. You're constantly aspiring to do more, to be better, to work through these grades, and you nobody ever gets through all 10. Um, but you're aspiring, and to aspire is good. 